Hello, this is Patrick from AI Tutor, and today's gonna be a tough day because it's gonna be stats and mechanics. Now, I know how much pain this causes students. So today I'm gonna go through the Edexcel June 2019 paper three, which is stats and mechanics. So I'm gonna give you these four work solutions and hopefully this can help a little bit. Now, if you were to look at this paper, you'd see it split up as paper three, one statistics and paper three, two mechanics. However, you actually sit these all in one on the exam day. So I'm just gonna put them all together in one video now. And if you would like to kind of jump to a specific question, there will be kind of chapters down at the bottom if you don't want to watch the whole thing. Cool. Now, I'm not going to have time to kind of fully explain everything to do with every question in this video. So if you want full detail and a full course, as well as loads of practice questions and progress tracking and all of that, go over to AI Tutor. I'll leave a link in the description and that can fully help you grasp these concepts. But for now, we're going to crack on with the statistics, which is paper three, one. So question one looks like we've got some probability. So it says three bags, A, B, and C, each contain one red marble and some green marbles. Bag A contains one red and nine green, bag B contains one red and four green, and bag C contains one red and two green. Okay. Sasha selects at random one marble from bag A. If he selects red marble, he stops. Okay, and if it's green, he continues and does the same with bag B. That one's red, again, he stops. And if it's green, he continues by selecting from bag C. Draw a tree diagram to represent this information. Okay, so always think kind of chronologically in terms of a tree diagram, right? Start at the left and then say, right, what's the first thing that happens? Then, you know, what happens after that? And then it branches off. And then, you know, what happens after that? So think, what's the first thing that happens here? He's picking from bag A. So that is going to be the thing that I want to start my tree diagram off with. So on the left here, I'll have bag A. Then he does his stuff. He then goes to bag B. And then, you know, he picks or carries on or whatever, and then goes to bag C. So we can see that it's kind of going this way in a nice ordered fashion. So we then say, okay, well, he starts at bag A. What can happen? So he can either get a green or a red. Yeah. So it's going to be GR. Okay. What are the probability is of these? So if there's one red and nine greens in the bag, then there's 10 in total in the bag. So the probability of getting a green is going to be 9 over 10, 9 over the total. And the probability of a red is 1 over 10. So these two numbers should always add up to 1, so make sure that that's the case. Okay, if he gets a green, what then happens? Well, he goes again into bag B, doesn't he? So bag B is going to be a similar kind of thing. It's going to be, okay, well, in bag B, I can either get a green or a red. Similar kind of thing. What are the probabilities associated with it? Well, there's one red and four greens, total of five. So G is going to be four over five, and R is going to be one over five. But on bag A, if I get a red, then what happens? Well, nothing, right? He stops. He stops if he gets a red. So I actually don't have to do anything here, which is sweet. So it just all, it, it ends there, essentially. So with this one here, similar thing. If I get a green, what happens? Well, I go to bag C. So if I go to bag C, Again, I can either get a G or an R. And what are the probabilities? Well, there's three in total, one red and two greens. So the probability of a green is two thirds and a red is one third. And then at bag C, I stop. So there's nothing else coming from there. So it's always kind of this story that you're taking it this way. Cool. So now it's gonna be quite easy to get probabilities associated with this. So it says, find the probability that Sasha selects three green marbles. So once you have the tree diagram, to get probabilities, you actually just kind of follow follow like a route, like a path. So if I want three greens, I say, well, what is the way I can do that? The only way I can do that is by going here, here, and here. So this red line here, G, 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 is my story, my the probability that I want. So I'm going to be using the and rule here, which because basically it says, okay, what's the probability I get a green? and then another green, and then another green. And when we use the AND rule, we have to times probabilities. So it's just going to be the following. 9 over 10, which is bag from uh, green from bag A, times by AND, 4 over 5, green from bag B, times by 2 over 3. Straight to your calculator, and that should do it. So we're going to get 9 over 10, times by 4 over 5, times by two over three, and that is going to get me 12 over 25. Fantastic. So part C, what do we have? Find the probability that Sasha selects at least one marble of each color. Okay, so again, 
think of the different routes down this tree diagram that would lead me to what I want. So at least one of each colour. So if I get a red from bag A, I get a red, but then I stop. So I'm not going to get any greens. So that's not enough because I need one of each. If I get a green and then a green and then a green, again, I've only had a green and, and I need one of each. So there are only a couple of ways I can actually get this. If I get a green and then a red, I stop there and I've, and I've got one of each. So that works. If I get a green and then another green and then a red, that also works because I've got, you know, at least one of each. And there's actually no other ways I can do that there. Because if I get the red instantly, I don't get any greens. Then if I get all the greens, well, I don't get any reds. So all I have to do now is work out the individual probability of these two. And then I'm going to add them together because that's the or rule. If I, if I have the probability of this happening or this happening, I add the probabilities. So GR is going to be, just follow the root, 9 by 10 times by 1 by 5. So 9 over 10 times by 1 over 5. That is going to equal, I don't need the calculator for that one because that's a 1, so I just need to times these, so that's just 9 over 50. And then GGR, so it's going to be 9 over 10 times 4 over 5, that's the GG. And then times by the R, which is 1 third. This, I'm going to be lazy, use my calculator, you're not impressing anyone if you don't, so 9 over 10 times by 4 over 5 times by 1 over 3 is going to equal 6 over 25. Okay, am I done? Not quite, because I now need to add these. I'm saying, well, that, that means that the probability of getting at least one of each colour is going to be, uh, so I can even say here, probability, just one of each. Something like that. It's just going to be 9 by 50. Add 6 by 25, which is going to equal 21 over 50. Cool. Part D. Given that Sasha selects a red marble, find the probability that he selects it from bag B. Okay. Anytime you see this word, given, you're thinking instantly. Conditional probability. And then every time you think conditional probability, you need to think of the conditional probability formula. And that simply is the probability of A given B equals the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. I cannot stress how important this is enough. This formula changes everything. It is so much easier to work with. If I kind of have this A given B, it's hard for me to make easy, logical kind of suggestions and stuff. However, as soon as I get it into these probabilities, I can, I can really easily read things off and say, oh, probability of B, well, that's just that. Probability of A and B, well, that's just that kind of thing. So always use this formula, apply the formula, and then things are going to get easy, trust me. So let's just apply it in our case. What we want, we want the probability that he selects it from bag B, given that he selects a red marble. So that's going to be probability red from B, given that I just get a red. So without thinking, I don't care about thinking, I just go straight into the formula and then see what comes out of it. So I'm going to get what? Probability of A and B. So that's the probability that I get a red from B and I get a red in general. And then that's just going to be all over the probability of getting a red. So we can now start to kind of make some little kind of intuitive bits of logic here because then we say, okay, the probability I get a red from B and I get a red well, if I get a red from B, I know I've got a red, right? So that actually means that this is just going to be the same as the probability of getting a red from B. So that's great, because now that's just going to be, I'll be able to work that out for my tree diagram. And then probability of getting a red, I can also work this out for my tree diagram. So let's have a look. Red from B. There's only one way to do this, isn't it? What I need to do is I need to get a green from A and then a red from B. So that's going to be 9 over 10 times by 1 fifth. Straight in here. 9 over 10 times 1 fifth. And then all of that's going to be divided by the probability of getting a red. Okay, so this might be a bit more because there's a few ways I can get a red. I can get it from A, get it from B, or get it from C. So getting it from A is going to be... Well, let's actually have a look here. I've got a couple here, which is nice. GR, that's getting it from B. 
G, G, R, that's getting it from C, and I've already added both of these together, which is 21 over 50. So that's this one and this one. All I need to do is add getting it from A there, and I'm sweet. So if I just do 21 over 50 plus 1 over 10, that gets me the probability of a red. So that's going to be 21 over 50 plus 1 over 10. Now straight to the calculator. Make sure you are careful with all of your syntax, all your fractions and brackets and stuff. So I'm going to get 9 over 10 times by 1 over 5. And then all of that is going to be divided by 21 over 50 plus 1 over 10. And that is going to get me 9 over 26. And I believe we are good with question 1. Question two looks absolutely massive. Okay, so the partially completed box plot in figure one shows the distribution of daily mean air temperatures using the data from the, oh, the large data set. Okay, for Beijing in 2015. So we're going to need a bit of large data set knowledge for this question. An outlier is defined as a value more than 1.5 times IQR, which is the interquartile range, below Q1 or more than 1.5 times IQR above Q3. The three lowest air temperatures in the data set are 7.6, 8.1, 9.1, and the highest is 32.5. Complete the box plot in figure one, showing clearly any outliers. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need to do is work out kind of what an outlier is. So it tells us luckily. So first of all, it's to do with Q1 and Q3. Now these are the lower and upper quartiles, which are represented by the start and the end of this box in a box plot. So the interquartile range is basically the difference between these quartiles. So Q3 minus Q1. So let's get that before we continue. So Q3 we have here, right? And that looks to be 26.6. So this is going to be 26.6. And then Q1 looks to be 19.4. So if we just do 26.6 minus 19.4 on our calculators, we're going to get 7.2. So we can then work out what these limits are because it says more than 1.5 times IQR below Q1. So we can just call it, I don't know, LL for lower limit, whatever, equals. So Q1, which is my 19.4, and then minus 1.5 times my interquartile range. So that is going to be the following. 19.4 minus 1.5 times 7.2 is going to get me 8.6. And then the upper limit is going to be my Q3, which is going to be 26.6. And then plus 1.5 times 7.2. Again, straight to the calculator. which is going to get me 37.4. Okay, so that means that if I have any values outside of that range, they're going to be outliers. So sometimes a box plot is called a box and whisker plot because these whiskers, which are lines here at the end, they represent the lowest and highest values of the data. However, if something's an outlier, the whisker will be, the whisker is going to be like the lowest value that isn't an outlier and the upper one is going to be the highest value that isn't an outlier. So that's why we need to work out these outliers and these limits before we can get our whiskers. So now we say, okay, let, let's look at the top whiskers. The highest air temperature is 32.5. So that is not an outlier because the, the upper limit for outliers is 37.4. So that means that my, my top volume, my top whisker is just going to be at this 32.5. So if I was to go to here just between 32 and 33, I'm going to get my whisker here. So what I do is just a straight line like that, and then I take it to the middle box. So that's going to be my top whisker. So now let's think about the lower values. So 7.6, 8.1, and 9.1. Look at the limit here. The lower limit is 8.6. So that means that 7.6 and 8.1 are both outliers. So let's get these on the graph here. So 7.6 is going to be about three squares in between 7 and 8. That's my 7.6. 8.1 is just going to be right near the 8 here. So they're my outliers. It then says, so it says show clearly. So maybe just be really clear to your examiner. You know, maybe give them a little... 
you know, do whatever you can to really let the examiner know that you know what you're doing. So, you know, really let them know there. So there you outliers. Now my whisker is going to be at my lowest value, which isn't an outlier. So 9.1 is, is nicely in this range here. So that's going to be where my whisker is. So 9.1 is about here. Do your line for your whisker and then bring it all the way to the box plot. Cool. That should be part A. Part B, using your knowledge of the large data set, a sentence that no one in an exam ever wants to read, suggest from which one the two outliers are likely to have come. Okay, so I can't say much here apart from you just need knowledge of the large data set. If you don't have knowledge, I really can't see how you'd get this question right. So I'm not gonna you know, do a lecture about the large data set now, but essentially if, if, if you're up on it, then you would know that from Beijing, you have data between May and October. And you would also know that the kind of air temperature in Beijing from this data and kind of general knowledge is that in October, it's going to be the lowest, which would correspond to these kind of lower temperatures here. So if you've not, you know, become accustomed to the large data set, you're not going to have a clue what I'm on about. And I wouldn't expect you to. So that's, that's what I would say here. If you don't know what I'm on about, get a bit more used to the large data set. So essentially, I would say October here um, because, you know, uh it has the lowest air temperatures from may to october let's let's go for that and um, that'll be enough that they'll know what you're on about if you say that cool so um part c let's have a look here so using the data from the large data set simon produced the following summary statistics okay for the daily mean air temperature for beijing in 2015. so we've got n we've got x and we've got s x x show that to three significant figures the standard deviation is 5.19 okay this is a mark so act accordingly luckily there is a very simple formula for standard deviation when you have the s x x they've already done a lot of work for you once you've got that s x x so essentially the standard deviation and you will have this formula so don't worry about it too much it's just going to be the square root of s s s x x over n that's it this is this is in your formula booklet so don't worry too much about this so just, just get it into your calculator right square root of is going to be 4153, no, it's not. Uh, careful, it's gonna be 4952, 4952.906, and then divided by N, which is 184. And that is 5.188 dot, dot, dot. And it says to three significant figures, 5.19. So to three sig fig, 5.19. Then that's my three significant figures. Perfect. Okay, we're getting through here. So Simon now decides for some reason to model air temperatures with the random variable. Okay, so this is a normal distribution. So it says T is normally distributed and then with a mean of 22.6 and a variance of 5.19 squared. So remember, this is because we usually model normal distributions with mu sigma squared. So in this case, my sigma, my standard deviation is 5.19 and my mu or mean 22.6. Using Simon's model, calculate the 10th to 90th interpercentile range. What is that? Think of a normal distribution, okay? So a couple of things that we can do here. So a lot of the time we can say, okay, here's a value, and then give me the probability that X or T or whatever it is, is less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to that value. But we don't want that now. We're going the other way. We're saying, okay, what is the value such that the probability of me being less than that is 0.9 or 90%. So here we're asking for, okay, I've given you the fact that all of this is 90%. So I've given you the area, what is this value? That's what the 90th percentile is. And then similarly with the 10th percentile, it would be right here and it would say, what is the value that gives me an area here of 10%. So again, what is that? And then the interpercentile range, just like the interquartile range up there on part A, we're just gonna do the 90th one, take away the 10th. So because we're given the area and we wanna get the value down here, this is when we use the inverse normal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to menu and we're gonna go to seven, which is distribution and three, which is inverse normal. So to get the 90th one, we're going to do area as 0.9 because that's the probability that corresponds to 90%. So area is 0.9. And then you're just going to put your sigma and your mu in, which is all right. So my sigma looks to be 
and my mu looks to be 22.6. All I need to now do is press equals. So it looks like for this, we have 29.251, da, 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 da. And then really similar thing now. So let's just go back to this. Now we've, we've already got our sigma and our mu in the calculator. The only thing I need to change is the area. So I'm going to change that to 0 0.1. And that is now going to get me 15.948, da, 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 da. So what we now do is just take them away. And we can see this is good. This should definitely be bigger than this. So that's at least a nice. So just going to do 29.251 remembering to get my calculator back into the normal mode, which is one. So now I'm going to do 29.251 minus 15.948. And that is going to get me 13.303. I'll round that to three sig fig, because that seems to be what we're doing in this question. So the, I'll call it the IPR for interpercentile range, it's going to equal 13.3. So note how I took a lot more significant figures for these before I got the end result and then I wound it at the end. So last part says the following. Simon wants to model another variable from the large data set for Beijing using a normal distribution. State two variables from the large data set. Okay. For Beijing that are not suitable to be modeled by a normal distribution. Give a reason for each answer. Okay. So a couple of things here. The first thing is we need to know some general kind of main points about normal distributions. And the second is we need to know about this large data set again, but I'm not going to repeat myself because I did talk about that in part A. Essentially, normal distributions, you can see what they look like. We've got numbers and then it's a bell curve. So it can only represent quantitative data, right? It can only represent stuff that's represented as numbers. So if there's something that is qualitative, like for example, eye color, I can't put that on a normal, it'd just be like blue green, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about the large data set and think about for Beijing, if there is anything that is qualitative and there is, and it's windfall. And the reason is, well, not windfall, wind speed, I suppose. Um, not quite wind speed because that could be quantitative, but in the large data set, we have it in the Beaufort scale. And what that is, is that describes wind speed with, with words like calm or heavy or stuff like that. So that is something that I can't plot on a normal. So I, I would just say, uh, you know, this is qualitative data. So that would be my one. And the second one, we need to think a bit more about the normal. And this is going to be a bit harder as well, because it's not just a, you know, oh, there's not numbers. It's clearly not normal. So for the rainfall in Beijing, we have the fact that it's not actually that symmetrical. Look at a normal distribution. They're always symmetrical, right? However, the rainfall data for Beijing isn't. You have a lot where it just doesn't rain loads. So it's definitely really skewed. There's a, lot of, there's a lot that actually just has zero days rainfall. So essentially, I would say this. I would just say rainfall, um, it's not symmetric. Um, and I would say that there are lots of days with zero. So same thing as the other part, you will have no idea what I'm talking about right now if you've not seen the large data set, and I wouldn't expect you to. So that's the only thing I can say there. You need to revise it like you would anything else. Cool, that would be part two. Question three, Barbara is investigating the relationship between average income and average annual carbon dioxide emissions for different countries. It takes a random sample of 24 countries and finds the product moments correlation coefficient between average annual CO2 emissions and average income to be 0.446. Stating your hypotheses clearly, test at the 5% level of significance whether or not the product moment correlation coefficient for all countries is greater than zero. Okay. You're not doing a stats paper and getting away without doing a hypothesis test, right? So you're going to have to buckle up and just do it. So essentially what's going on, right? We've got hypotheses. So it's going to be, you know, my kind of H0 and H1. I'm testing this hypothesis. I'm going to have a significance level, which is kind of like, right, how much do I want to believe in my result? How sure do I want to be? From my significance level, I'm going to get a critical value, which is okay. You know, if your result is greater than this, I can accept. If it's less than this, I can reject something like that. And then once I've got that critical value, we just literally do, as, as I said, we compare the result we have. And then from there, we can accept or reject. 
So that's the kind of overview of a hypothesis test. It's going to change each time depending if it's kind of a binomial or normal, or in this case, to do with correlation coefficients. So the first thing we want to do is state our hypotheses. So the null hypothesis. So look what we're testing for here. It says whether or not the product moment correlation coefficient is greater than zero. So the product moment correlation coefficient is this row. So if we're testing whether it's greater than zero, the null is just going to be that it's equal to zero. And then my alternative, my H1, is going to be that it's greater than zero because that's kind of what I'm testing. OK, so now we have a 5% level of significance. So alpha is 0 0.05. We also have my sample size here, and that is n equals 24. So now, in terms of correlation coefficients, the amount of math you have to do isn't that much, because with these two numbers, what I can now do is go to my formula booklet. You go down to the statistical tables, you are going to get a section called critical value for correlation coefficients. And what this does is given the sample size and your significance level, it can tell you the correlation coefficient that is going to be at that critical value. So super easy, right? My alpha is 0 0.05, so I'm looking here. My sample size is 24, so I go down to 24 and then go to 0 0.05 and it's going to be this value here. 0.3438. So my critical value is going to be 0.3438. So this tells me the following. It says, right, if your test correlation coefficient is greater than this, then you can assume, you know, you can accept your H1 and assume that rho is actually greater than zero. If it's not, you've not got enough evidence. So all we do now is compare this to the number that Barbara got. And look at this. Barbara got... 0.446. So that is greater than the critical value, meaning that it's in the critical region, meaning that we can accept this alternative hypothesis. So throwing a few more fancy words in, we can basically say, right, therefore, there is enough evidence. Now, this is where the significance level comes in, right? Because that critical value depends on the significance level. So what we can say is there is enough evidence at this significance level. So at the 5% level of significance, to suggest that uh, rho is greater than zero, essentially. So that rho is greater than zero, and to, you know, to suggest that it is greater than zero. Cool. Part B, Barbara believes that a non-linear model would be a better fit to the data. OK, she codes the data using the coding, and it's through the logarithm, so m is log to the base 10 of x. C is log to the base 10 of y and obtains the model C equals minus 1.28 plus 0.89m. OK, product moment correlation coefficient between C and M is found to be 0.882. Explain how this value supports Barbara's belief. OK, let's think about it. In part A, we have this model and she gets a product moment correlation coefficient of 0.446. She then says, mm, let's try a different model. Let's try this non-linear model. She does it, puts the data in and everything. And look, she gets a product moment correlation coefficient of 0.882. Remember what this number represents. If it's one, this is a perfect fit of the data, right? If it's zero, there's kind of no correlation at all. So 0.882 is much closer to one, isn't it? It's a lot greater than 0.446. So I would say... That, um, you know, value much closer to one. Um, so suggests a much better correlation, basically. Correlation um, and therefore supports Barbara's belief. It's a quick mark as well, isn't it? OK, show that the relationship between y and x can be written in the form y equals ax to the n where a and n are constants to be found. It's actually a bit of, bit of actual maths now, a bit of pure maths, right? So it's kind of just logarithms at this point. Look what we've got. We've got c, which is the same as log 10y. So let's get, our, let's get our maths hats on, right? So essentially, we've got c, log 10y, is equal to minus 1.82 plus 0.89m. But m is equal to log 10 of x. 
Right, cool. Uh, so what do we want? We want to get Y on its own, it looks like. So how are we going to do that? Let's have a think. If I have log of Y, what I can then do is do the kind of anti-log of both sides to get Y on its own. What I think it might be a better idea to do first, though, is to get a single log on the right-hand side. So I'm going to use some log laws, because if I just get log of y equal to log of something, then I'm just going to get y is equal to that thing. So I think we should do that first. So what I'm thinking is the following. Minus 1.82. I want a log to the base 10 here, because you can see I've only... So I essentially want log to the base 10 of something that is going to give me minus 1.82. Well, if you think about what a logarithm is, it's basically saying, what power do I need to raise 10 to to get this number? So imagine if I had this. Imagine if I had 10 to the minus 1.82. And then I said, well, what is log to the base 10 of that? Well, the power I need to raise 10 to to get 10 to the minus 1.82 is just minus 1.82. So this is exactly the same as minus 1.82. So then I'm going to add this log. Why am I doing all this? Because I can now use a log law to kind of get all of this together. So there's something I need to do first, though. I can't add these logs together just now because this has got a number in front of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this 0.89 up here using the power law. So this is going to be log to the base 10 of 10 to the minus 1.82. And then plus log to the base 10 of x. This goes up to the power to the 0.89. Now I can use log a plus log b is the same as log of a times b. So this is going to be log to the base 10 of this thing and then just times by this thing times by x to the 0 0.89. Look at this. Log of y equals log of all of this stuff. Well, the only way that can be true is if y is just equal to this. So 10 to the minus 1.82 and then times x to the 0.89. So let's look at the form we have here. It says y equals ax to the n. Well, I've got a number here, and then I've got an x, and then I've got an n. This isn't that nice, though, so why don't I just put it into my calculator and actually work out what it is? I'm just going to do 10 to the power of minus 1.82, and that's going to get me 0 0.0151 to three significant figures x to the 0.89. So what would that tell me? That would tell me that a is equal to 0.0151 and n is equal to 0.89. Question four. Magali is studying the mean total cloud cover in octas for Lucas in 1987 using data from the large data set. Not again. The daily mean total cloud cover for all 184 days from the large data set is summarized in the table below. Okay. So we've look at we've been given data, which is nice. We don't have to remember it. Um, one of the 184 days is selected at random. I find the probability that it has a daily mean total cloud cover of six or greater. Okay, so if you look at this, we have the daily mean total, and then we have how many days kind of had that, so the frequency. So six or greater, all we need to do is look to the table. We say, you know, what are the things that are six and greater? It's six, seven, and eight. So all I do is I say, well, look, there's 52 in six. 52 in 7 and 28 in 8. So then that's the total proportion that have 6. That's the total amount that have 6 or greater to get the proportion. And then the probability, I just need to divide it by the total amount there are. And we can see that the total here is 184. So it's as simple as doing this fraction straight to our calculator to get 52, add 52, add 28, all over 184 to get me 33 over 46. Cool. Magali is investigating whether the daily mean total cloud cover can be modeled using a binomial distribution. She uses the random variable x to denote the daily mean total cloud cover and believes that x is distributed binomially with n to be 8 and p, the probability of success, to be 0 0.76. Okay. Find, using Magali's model, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 6. So with binomials, you can use your calculator. We can use the binomial CD function, which means kind of cumulative distribution. Now, we need to be careful, though, because our calculator always gives us less than or equal to values. At least mine does anyway. So in other words, 
I have a probability that x is greater than 6, so I want that. But I need to get this in terms of probability x is less than something. Think about the different numbers this can be, you know, if it can be kind of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? I want these ones here, don't I? I want everything here. Now, if I have, if this is everything, then the probability of all of that is going to be 1. So, that means that to get this stuff here, all I would need to do is take the 1, which is everything, and then take away all of this stuff here, don't I? Because then, if I do everything, take away all of this, I'm just left with all of this. So that's actually quite nice, and the reason is, because I can now do one takeaway, what is this? This is any x value less than or equal to 5. So, that is something I can put in my calculator. So to get that number, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Menu, I'm going to go to my Distribution, and then I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go to Binomial CD, Cumulative Distribution. I'm then going to go variable because now I can put in my kind of n and my p and my x value here. So my x value, this is x is less than or equal to, that's going to be 5. n is going to be from the distribution, which is 8. p, again, from the distribution, which is 0 0.76. So press equals, you get a number. So in this case, remember, I'm going to still need to do the 1 minus in a sec, but this is going to be 0 0.29672 dot dot dot. So now all I need to do, I need to go back to my normal mode in my calculator, and then I'm just going to do 1 minus 0 0.29672, and then that's enough kind of significant figures. And then this is going to be 0 0.70328, etc. but it wants it to one decimal uh, so interesting, so it wants the next part to one decimal place, but it doesn't kind of tell me in this case, so I'm just going to go 0. Point, let's go 0. 0.703 for this one. Let's go three significant figures. Cool. It now says, find to one decimal place the expected number of days in a sample of 184 days with a daily mean total cloud cover of seven. Okay. First thing I'm going to want for this is just the probability that on any given day, x equals 7. And that, again, is something my calculator can tell me. So we need to be careful here because we're now not using a cumulative distribution, is it? Cumulative is less than or equal to everything adding up until that number. But we just want it being exactly equal to 7. So going back to my calculator and going to the distribution list, this is going to be binomial PD, binomial probability distribution. Super similar though, list and variable, go to your variable. You're putting in the same numbers now, but it's just going to give you the exact one. So x is going to be 7 now, n is going to be 8, and p is going to be 0 0.76. Again, press equals, get your answer. So this probability is 0 0.28118 dot dot dot, all of that. I'm not done, because it says the expected number of days. So if I've, if I've got 184 days, almost 184 times I'm doing this, rolling this dice, whatever, and the probability on each one that I get seven is gonna be this 0 0.28, I just need to times these two num numbers. So therefore, uh, the expected days, just gonna equal my answer which is my 0 0.28118 times by 184. And that is going to get me 51.737, etc. but it wants it to one decimal place. So this is going to be 51.7. So you expect 51.7 days. Cool. Explain whether or not your answers to part B support the use of Magali's model. Okay, so what we now do is we kind of look at what the answers would um, you know, expect, and then just compare it to what actually happened. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the first answer to part B, which is the probability that X is greater than or equal to six. So if you actually look at this, that's what we worked out in part A from the actual data, isn't it? It was 33 over 46. So let me just get that in terms of a decimal so we can compare. So this is equal to 0 0.7173, uh, et cetera. Okay, and then we expected it to be, from our model, 0 0.703. They're pretty similar, aren't they? I reckon that's quite good. Similar thing here, probability x is equal to 7, and therefore 
the amount of days that you would expect. We expected it to be 51.7, and look how many it actually was, 52. That's super close. I mean, if I round 51.7 to the nearest day, I get 52, don't I? So I reckon that it's pretty good, isn't it? So I would say, you know, in both cases, the model predicts, um, you know, numbers very close to the, you know, historical data. Um, and what does it say? So I reckon they do. So they, I would even say they strongly, let's go in for it. Why not? Now I'm here. So they strongly support the use of Megali's model. I reckon that is, is a pretty solid answer there. So let's have a look at the last part. There were 28 days that had a daily mean total cloud cover of eight. For these 28 days, the daily mean total cloud cover for the following day, okay, so the day after, is shown in the table below. So similar looking table, but remember this is for the days after there was eight octaves the day before. So find the proportion of these days when the daily mean total cloud cover was six or greater. So this is exactly what we did in part A, essentially, but just for a new table. Pretty nice, isn't it? So again, just go from six upwards. So what, we've got five here in the six, nine in the seven and nine in the eight divided by the total and the total was 28 straight to the calculator. So five plus nine plus nine all over 28 will get me 23 over 28, which is kind of 0 0.82 dot dot dot. Cool, okay. Comment on Magali's model in light of your answer to part D, okay. Let's have a think about this. In part A, we worked out the proportion that have six or greater from this historical data, okay? And we got about 0 0.7173. Then in part E, we worked it out. It's almost conditional, right? It's given, it's saying, okay, you know, what's the proportion of these days? You know, what's the probability that it's six or greater? Given that, the day before, had a cloud cover of eight. And we found the probability to be higher, didn't we? On 0 0.82, which kind of makes sense, right? If a day's really bad weather outside, stormy and cloudy, the next day is probably gonna be not great as well. So binomial distribution was the model that she used, right? But binomial assumes one really key important thing that the trials that each day, they have to all be independent. So what that means is that one day cannot affect the other. One trial can't affect the other, right? But they are clearly affecting each other here. We, we see that if it's cloudy on one day, it's more likely to be cloudy the next day. But we can't have that in a binomial. So I would say the following. I would say, you know, um, so part, you know, the answer to part D shows that um, the probability of a cloudy day is higher given the previous day was cloudy. Um, this suggests that, you know, the trials or days are not independent, um, independent, um, but we require, you know, independent trials for a binomial distribution. So, yeah, it, it doesn't satisfy the conditions of the binomial. Last question of the stats part of the exam, and the rain has just gone absolutely mad outside, but let's see if we can get through it. So, a machine puts liquid into bottles of perfume. The amount of liquid put into each bottle, D, follows a normal distribution with a mean of 25. So note how they've not given us the standard deviation here. So we've not got enough at this point. We've got a normal distribution with a mean of 25, but we don't understand the deviation. Given that 15% of the bottles contain less than 24.63, okay, so that piece of information is gonna be the one that gets us the standard deviation. It's just like an intermediary step there. And then we're gonna to wanna to find to two decimal places the value of K such that the probability that D is between 24.63 and K is 0.45. Okay, so the first thing is that they're using D. I'm very used to X, but that's fine. We can change that to a D. Okay, so, Given that 15% of the bottles contain less than 24.63, what are we gonna do here? Interestingly, that with your calculator, to, do, to use all of these kind of, you know, inverse normal distribution, normal distribution, all of that, we need to know the value of sigma and mu, because when we go to variable, it asks us for sigma. 
That's a bit of a problem now, isn't it? Because we don't know sigma. So I can't now go put in 15% into the area and then get the corresponding value because I don't know sigma. So this is where Z comes in. And what is Z? They call it maybe like the standard normal distribution. And it's just the normal that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So this is really useful for getting values out. The reason is any normal distribution, X or D in this case, gets transformed into Z if you take away the mu and divide by the sigma. So why is this useful? It's useful because of the following. I can get values for my Z because I know the mu and I know the sigma, so it's calculator friendly. I can then put them into here and rearrange to get what I want. So I'll show you what I mean. This says 15% of bottles contain less than 24.63. What I can do is go to my calculator, again, seven, inverse normal, and now I wanna put that 15% in for the area, and that's gonna be 0.15. Sigma is one, and mu is zero. You can see that these are actually the default values on my calculator because this Z is, is so widely used. So right there, that's going to give me a value, a Z value, as it were. And that is going to give me minus 1.036. So what I can now do is I can say, OK, well, that would mean that the corresponding D value is just going to be got from solving this equation, right? So I can say, OK, the corresponding D value, well, we're told what it is, is 24.63. So 24.63 minus mu, which we do know, 25, over sigma, which is my unknown, is going to equal minus 1.036. So we can see how we now use this information and this z distribution to get an equation. Now it's just rearranging, okay? So we're just going to do sigma equals whatever this is, 24.63 minus 25. You know, we're timesing up by sigma, dividing through by this negative number here. So this is going to be minus 1.036. To the calculator, again, you're going to want to change it to the normal mode so you can actually do some maths. So 24.63 minus 25 over minus 1.036 is equal to 5 over 14, which is nice, or about 0 0.357. Let's go for that. Cool. We're not done, are we? All we've done is we've got the sigma, but we can now at least use our calculator more as we're used to because we have all of the parameters. So find to two decimal places the value of k such that the probability of d being between those two values is 0 0.45. Okay, in a normal distribution, the probability that something is going to be between two values, so in this case, these two values, is just going to equal the probability that it's less than k minus the probability that it's less than the 24 0.63, I've missed out the D here. Why is that? I will explain this to you using a diagram. The probability that it's less than K is gonna be represented by all of this area here. Now, the probability that it's less than 24.63 is gonna be all of this area here. So if I take that blue area, and take the red area away from it, what am I going to be left with? I'm just going to be left with this black area, which is the probability that D is between K and 24.63. Cool. So this is a value that we know how to work out. We're also told that this is equal to 0 0.45, meaning this thing is going to be my, I'm going to get the value for this thing and I can then use my calculator for it. So let's get this value first of all. I know that this is 0 0.45. This is still gonna be my unknown because I don't know what that is. But then this thing, I can go to my calculator and I can go to the distribution. I can go to the normal CD cumulative and I can put in the following 24.63 for my upper. Now lower is just Essentially, you want it down as far as possible, don't you? So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with just, just doing minus and then smashing the nine button loads of times. You, you, need to, you do not need to be clever with this. Just smash the nine button, get a really low number. It's practically, you know, it's, low. it's, so, it's a number so low that it's negligible kind of thing. Um, put your sigma and your mu in. So my sigma, we know to be 0 0.357. 
357. And my mu, we also know to be 25 straight into the calculator to get 0 0.15, essentially. Got a load of zeros after it, but 0 0.15 will do. So add that to this side, and what do we get? We get the probability that d is less than k to be 0 0.6. This is now a job for the inverse normal, because now it's going the other way. It's saying, okay, we've got the area that this represents. Tell me the number on this horizontal axis. So I'm going to go to menu, distribution, inverse normal. I'm going to set my area to 0 0.6. The same mu and sigma from last time, which are nicely in there already. And that gets me the value of k to basically be 25 point. One uh, to two decimal places it wants. So I have here 25.09. Okay, a random sample of 200 bottles is taken. Using a normal approximation, find the probability that fewer than half of these bottles contain between 24.63 and K. Okay, so before we get into the approximation, let's think of what distribution this actually follows. We've got 200 bottles, and then all we're actually testing for is this kind of binary option, isn't it? It's saying, look, well, it either contains between 24.63 and K, or it doesn't. So this is going to be a binomial, isn't it? I've got 200 trials, and the probability of success on a given trial, well, we've already been told that in part A, it's going to be 0.45, isn't it? So now I just have all of these bottles and I test for how many have this. Okay, so what we kind of want to do is, you know, get the probability that it's fewer. However, we're asked to use a normal approximation here. So we can use a normal to approximate a binomial when A, N is large, which it is, it's 200 here, and B, P is near 0.5. So that means that the binomial would be more or less symmetrical like a normal. These are both satisfied here. 200 is large, 0.45 is quite close to 0.5. So we are good to use the normal. What is the normal approximation? So it means that the mu is going to be NP and the variance is going to be NP 1 minus P. So I'm going to work out these values and I'm then going to get a normal distribution. So the normal distribution is going to be, as call it Y, whatever you want, N. Now my mu value is NP, so I'm going to do 200 times 0.45 to get me 90. And my variance is going to be NP times one minus P, so it's gonna be the 90, which just worked out, times one minus 0.45. And that gets me 49.5. So you've got a couple of options here. Usually in a normal distribution, you have a sigma squared, this is my value of sigma squared, but if you want, you could do the square root of this and then write that squared. It's completely up to you. I mean, if I was to do the square root of this answer, I would get kind of 7.035 and then I would write that squared. Either way is fine. Okay, so what do we now want? We want the probability that fewer than a half I have lost where I'm looking. Find the probability that fewer than half of these bottles contains between, okay, these two numbers. So fewer than half, so fewer than the 100 essentially, right? So what I want is the probability that X is kind of less than 100. Okay, so that is essentially going to be kind of 99 and below, right? So that's the probability that X is going to be less than or equal to 99. Okay. We can't quite put a 99 into the normal because there's one thing we need to do, and that is something called a continuity correction. So think of these two words, right? Continuity. So essentially, a binomial is discrete and the normal is continuous. So it's to do with the continuity because I've got a discrete distribution, but I'm approximating it. I need to sneeze, and I think it's gone. Oof. And I'm approximating it with a continuous distribution. So the continuity correction, I'm correcting for that change in continuity. So this is interesting. If I was just in binomial land, I would do this. I would say x is less than or equal to 99 because it can only take jumps. But I'm in continuous land. So x can be 99, but it can also be 99.1, 0.2, So it can be all of these numbers. So what I want to actually do is use all of the numbers which are then going to round to a number less than or equal to 99. 
So actually anything up to 99.5 here, if I get that number, I'm then gonna round it down to 99, aren't I? So this is what the continuity correction is. It's actually usually just, it's adding a 0.5 a lot of the time, but you really need to think about, you know, if you wanna go down or up. So in this case, now I'm ready to use this. So I can go to my calculator at this point and go to normal CD again, because that's what I'm doing. I'm using this less than. So, and I'm going to get the following. So my lower, again, just really low number, minus 9999, whatever, doesn't matter. Upper is gonna be this 99.5. Sigma, so this is why I was talking about that kind of square root of 49.5 before, because you put sigma into your calculator, not sigma squared. So I'm not gonna put 49.5 in, I'm gonna put the square root of 49.5 as my sigma and my mu is going to be 90 press equals, and I get my probability. So that's gonna be 0.9. Does it ask for a amount of significant figures or anything? No, so let's maybe just go to three. So that's gonna be 912. It's quite high, isn't it? Does that make sense? I would say yes, because the probability of being between these is less than a half, isn't it? So you would kind of naturally expect less than a half of them to have that. So that's why this probability is quite high here. Okay, the machine is adjusted so that the standard deviation of the liquid put in the bottles is now 0.16. Following the adjustments, Hannah believes that the mean amount of liquid put in each bottle, they're gonna do another hypothesis test. When you thought it was all over, put in each bottle is less than 25. She takes a random sample of 20 bottles and finds the mean amount of liquid to be 24.94. Okay, test Hannah's belief, the 5% level of significance. Okay, a few things going on here. We've got a hypothesis test. Okay, so what are the hypotheses? Okay, so it seems like my H naught is, so look, Hannah believes that the mean amount is less than 25. So the H naught is just gonna be okay, the mean is 25. And then the H1, which is what Hannah believes her hypothesis is going to be, look, I actually think this is less than 25. Okay, so now what's the distribution of the thing that she is kind of doing? So it says the mean is adjusted so that so we, we, we kind of have the mean and we have this standard deviation here. So we need to be kind of careful because I can't just put this standard deviation and the mean in. And the reason is because I have a sample, look, it says she takes a random sample of 20 and then finds the mean amount. So I'm not just doing this base distribution, I'm doing the sample mean. So a sample mean is always distributed as follows, with the same mean as the underlying distribution, but the, the variance is actually then divided by the sample size, which kind of makes sense, right? If I keep getting more, that's going to be a more and more accurate um, representation. So the variance is going to go further down once I take that mean. Okay, so essentially, let's get these numbers in here and we can then start working out some critical values. So what's this going to be equal to? My mu, where we're saying this assuming H naught is true, so this is going to be this 25. Sigma squared is going to be this 0.16 squared, and then n is going to be 20. So again, let's just actually work out these numbers. So go back to my normal mode. Let's do 0.16 all squared, and then I'm gonna divide that by 20. So I get, you know, 1.2, a very small number essentially. Let's rewrite that as the standard deviation squared. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna square root this answer and then I'm gonna get about, about 0 0.0358, and then that's gonna be squared. So at least I've got my sigma now. Okay, what do we now do, right? What we now need to do is we get the significance level to get a critical region, and then we can say, okay, are we in or out? So what does it say? The significance level is 5%. So I wanna kind of explain what this means here. Here we have a normal distribution, which, which this sample mean is. What it's saying is the following. I'm gonna have some value which gives me just 5% here. So it's quite small, isn't it? And that's the thing we care about because we're interested in mu being less than this here. So what we need to do is we say, okay, where is this value gonna be? And then what is the value that I got? So let's go to the calculator again. So we're gonna to go to the inverse normal. We're gonna put in everything. So the area here is gonna be this tiny 5%, isn't it? It's gonna be 0.05. So that's 
essentially this thing here. My sigma is this 0 0.0358. My mu is going to be 25. And what that gets me is a, is a critical value here. And that's going to be 24.94, etc. So, and I'll say, okay, that is the value at which it's going to tip. If you get a value lower than that, you've got a good amount of, you know, evidence to suggest that the mean is lower. But if it's not lower than that, then there's not enough evidence at this 5% level. What was the mean that she got? She got 24.94. Ooh, okay. So she looks to be right on the edge. I got 24.941. And then a few more things in the calculator, but she got 24.94. So she is just past it, isn't it? She's just smaller than that critical value. So I can say, therefore, there is enough evidence at the 5% level to suggest that the mean is lower, smaller than 25. Just in there. Okay, so that was it for the stats section. Some pretty tough questions in there, but luckily it was short and sweet. Well, short and horrible. So, you know, only five questions to deal with. Um, but no worries for the wicked. Let's go straight into the mechanics. So, question one, looks like we've got some vectors and stuff like that. So it says at time t seconds, where t is greater than or equal to zero, a particle p moves so that its velocity v is given by, and then v equals six t i minus five, to the there, minus 5t to the 3 over 2j. Okay, when t equals 0, the position vector of p is this, which is minus 20i plus 20j. And we want to find the acceleration of p when t equals 4. Okay, so there's kind of two things we're working with here. The first is vectors, and the second is kind of like calculus within kinematics. So this generally refers to when we have acceleration that is not constant. So when we have constant acceleration, we use the Subat equations. But when we don't, we, we use calculus, essentially. And the main thing that you need to realize is the following. If you take these three quantities, right, displacement, velocity, and acceleration, look, let's write them here. So displacement, which I can write as S, and then velocity, which I'll write as V, and then acceleration, A. Right, okay. So if I want to go with this way, displacement to velocities for acceleration, I need to differentiate. So what that means is, if I, if I have S and I want to get V, I need to differentiate. If I have V and I want to get A, I need to differentiate. And then, to go the other way, just the opposite of differentiation, right, I integrate. So if I want to go this way, I integrate. So honestly, all you need to do is learn this flow. This way I differentiate, this way I integrate. So in this case, it says, right, find the acceleration and we have the velocity. So we go, okay, well, let's look here. I want to get to A and I'm at V. I need to differentiate. So what that tells me is that the acceleration is dV by dt. I differentiate the velocity. So just straight in, right, we differentiate the I part, we differentiate the J part. So for the I part, I have 6T, so I differentiate that, I get 6. So I get 6 lots of I. And then for the J part, I'm going to bring this 3 over 2 to the front. So I'm going to get minus 3 over 2 times 5, and then t, take 1 from the power. So 3 over 2 minus 1 is a half, lots of j. Clean up a bit, you can't do much, but we can at least get this into one number. So I'm just going to times this top here, so that's going to be 15 over 2. t to the half, lots of j. That's it. But then it says when t equals 4. So just sub t equals 4, right? So when t equals 4, a is going to equal, well, this is always going to be 6 because it's not even a function of t. 6i and then minus 15 over 2, 4 to the half, that's going to be 2, but I'll write it in anyway. And then, okay, so this is nice. So there's a 2 on the bottom here. 4 to the half is the square root of 4, which is 2, so I know these 2s are going to cancel. So I'm going to get 6 minus 15, 6i minus 15j. That's it. So the other bit now, I assume we're going to have to do the integration side. Now, there's one thing that we need to take into account here. You need a plus C. 
So if I, let's have a look here, we need the position vector. So what we need to do is basically that's relative, um, kind of relative to the displacement. So essentially, if we get the displacement from t equals zero, we can then say, okay, well, it started off here and then we can work it out from there. So I'll show you what I mean. We need to integrate the velocity here. So I'm going to say the following, the displacement is going to be the integral of the velocity. So the velocity is going to be 6t i minus 5t to the 3 over 2 j dt. So you could do these kind of as separate integrals. The i's and the j's are really just kind of going to sit outside here, but I'll, I'll just put it all in together and you'll see what I mean. So integrate 6t, I'm going to add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So this is a t to the 1, add 1 to it, I get t to the 2. And then I'm going to do 6 divided by 2. So it's going to be 3t squared, lots of i. And then minus, so what do, I, what do I do here? I add 1 to the power to get 5 over 2. And then I have 5 divided by 5 over 2. Or in other words, 5 times by 2 over 5. And then t to the 5 over 2, j. Be careful here. So what I've got here is a vector. And I've just done an indefinite interval. So I'm going to need a plus c. But it wouldn't really make sense for me to just write plus c here. And that's because, look, everything here is in a vector. But this is just some scalar at the end. So essentially what I actually need is I need a plus c for the i and a plus c for the j. So there's a couple of ways I could do this. I could say that c itself is a vector, which is going to be some, you know, some amount of i plus some amount of j. Or what I could do is I could put in like a plus c i here and a plus c j there that are both scalars. But, but just let it be known that there's, there's going to be a c for kind of both of these vectors here. Okay, so it's now just a case of saying, right, we need to get this c. Do we have any information that can let us get that? Well, well we do, right? Because we know that when t equals zero, the position vector of p is that. So if I sub t equals zero into here, set my s as this minus 20i plus 20j, then I'll be sorted. So let's do the following, minus 20i plus 20j equals sub t equals zero into here, that's gonna go. So is this, which is, which is lovely. So I actually just get, look, well this c is just that then, isn't it? So that's sweet. So now I can do the following, I can say that s or in other words, the, the position at this point, isn't it? Equals, how many i's have I got? So I'm gonna write 3t squared, and then I've got this i here, so minus 20, lots of i, plus how many j's have I got? Well, I've got this 20 here, and then I've got minus all of this stuff here, haven't I? So minus, these fives are gonna cancel out, so that's just gonna be 2t to the 5 over 2 lots of j. At this point, I sub in my t equals 4. So straight in I get 3 times 4 squared minus 20 lots of i plus 20 minus 2 times 4 to the 5 over 2 lots of j. Straight to the calculator. So what we're going to get, let's do the i's first. We'll get 3 times 4 squared or minus 20. That's going to be 28. 28 lots of i, and then the j's, I get 20 minus 2 times 4 to the 5 over 2, and that is going to be minus 44, so that's minus 44 lots of j. Question 2. A particle p moves with constant acceleration 2i minus 3j meters per second squared. Time t equals 0, the particle is at point a and is moving with velocity minus i plus 4j meters per second, and t equals t seconds, p is moving in the direction of the vector 3i minus 4j, and the value of t. Okay, quite similar to the last question, but with one key difference. Remember in the last question where I said the acceleration isn't constant, it's a function of t, that means we can't use SUVA equations and we can't, you know, we have to use calculus instead. But look at this. We've got the vectors, so it looks a lot like the, the first question, but it's a constant acceleration. You know, it's 2i minus 3j, it's a vector, but it's constant, it's not a function of t. That means that we can use SUVA here. But part a, I want you to be really careful. At time t equals t, the velocity of p isn't 3i minus 4j. 
it's moving in the direction of 3i minus 4j. Now I can see a lot of students just thinking that v is equal to 3i minus 4j, they're setting up an equation and getting a wrong answer. But that direction thing is super important. So what does that actually mean? The, the, the vector 3i minus 4j, imagine it's kind of represented like this, isn't it? I'd have three going this way and then kind of four going down this way. So it'd look, it'd look like that. If I was to think of kind of my result, if this was a velocity, my resultant velocity would be I'm going down that way. So we're not told that our velocity is that, but what we are told is our velocity is moving in the direction of this. So if we were to draw our velocity, so what would happen is it would be in the direction of this. So it could be a lot smaller could be a lot bigger. We don't know, essentially. So this could be what our velocity looks like. We don't know the values of x and y, for example, you know, it's i and j components. But what we do know is that this would be a similar triangle, wouldn't it? It's moving in exactly the same direction. These lines, albeit of a different magnitude, of a different length, they are parallel. So there is something that we can say here if these two triangles are similar. It's that the ratio between these lengths no matter how big they are, the ratio is always going to be the same. So this one here, if I did the j divided by the i, I'd get minus 4 over 3. And then whatever our velocity is here, I know that this must be the same as whatever the j is divided by whatever the i is. So that is the piece of information we're going to use, not the fact that the velocity is equal to that. Okay, so we now say, well, if we were to try and work out our velocity, what would it be? And then we're going to hopefully get that ratio, set it equal to this minus 4 over 3, and everyone's going to be a winner. So we are allowed to use that. V equals u plus at, right? We've got u at time t equals 0. We've got a, and then we've got t, which is that big t. So v will equal u plus at. Remember the vectors I'm underlining. So what we're going to get, u is going to equal minus i plus 4j. A is going to equal 2i minus 3j, and then t is this big T, isn't it? So I always like to group my i's, group my j's. So in terms of i, what do we have? We're going to get this 2t here, and then minus 1 lot of i here, and then all of that's times by i. J's, we have a 4 here, minus 3t here, lots of j. So what do we now know? this right so we now know that my y which i set to be whatever we have in j so my 4 minus 3t divided by my i which is 2t minus 1 is going to equal minus 4 over 3 and we have ourselves an equation right so times up by the 2t minus 1 just get rid of your fractions clean everything up you're used to this by now right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to times by this 3 so i'm going to get 3 times by 4 minus 3t equals minus 4 times by 2t minus 1, multiply it out, see what happens. So what do we get? 12 minus 9t equals minus 8t plus 4. So let's get my t's on to one side so that they're positive. So I'm going to add 9t here. That's going to leave me with a t. I'm going to take 4 from both sides, leaving me with an 8. t is 8. Sweet. Okay, part b. Time t equals 4 seconds. Here's at the point B, okay? Find the distance AB. Cool. So, do we know where A is? Particle is at point A. We don't know where A is. We probably don't need to know where A is, though, because if we just take A as kind of our origin and then find wherever B is, then we would have the displacement and then we will be able to get the distance from them. So, in other words, I just need to find, you know, taking A as my, you know, origin point where I started, I need to find my displacement at t equals 4. So let's just think of what we can do. This is going to be SUVA, right? So let's, let's write down SUVA and just, just see what we have, okay? So we have t equals 4. Fantastic. We know what the acceleration is. It is 2i minus 3j. And we need three quantities to get another with SUVA. Do we have any others? We do. We have the initial, don't we? Because we know that the initial velocity is minus i plus 4j. So I think we're good. What do we want? We want s. So I believe in this case, we could use s 
equals ut plus a half a t squared and it's just now a case of subbing them in so u here we go minus i plus 4j all times by t which is 4 plus a half a 2i minus 3j times t squared times 4 squared what do we have okay uh, let's go slow here. So I'm going to get minus 4i plus 16j. Let's see if I can do some nice simplification here. 4 squared is going to be 16. And then I've got to divide it by 2. So I'm essentially times in this by 8. So I'm going to get 8 times 2i. So that's going to be plus 16i. And then 8 times minus 3 is going to be minus 24. Lots of j. Get your i's together. Get your j's together. So I get 16 minus 4i, so that's going to be 12i. And then 16 minus 24j is going to be minus 8j. Okay, are we done? We're not, because what we currently have is the displacement between a and b, but we want the distance. So let me kind of highlight that difference for you here. a is going to be here. b it's going to be here. Note how I don't know exactly where A and B are, but it doesn't matter because I just, I just care about them relative to each other. So what I know is that the displacement from A to B is going to be 12i. So I get 12 going this way, and then I'm going to get 8 going down this way. But what I actually want is the distance, don't I? So I want this line. It's just going to be Pythagoras, right? So the distance AB is just going to equal the square root of... 12 squared plus 8 squared, which straight to the calculator, 12 squared plus 8 squared in a square root is going to get me 4 root 13. Now, I'm just going to keep it as 4 root 13. Um, I can get it as a decimal, you know, about 14.4, but, but I just lose accuracy, wouldn't I? So there's nothing stopping me just keeping it exact. And I believe, let's just see if there's any kind of um, unit here, and you can see that all of the units were working with meters per second, so it's going to be meters here. And I reckon that will do us for question two. Ooh, and it looks like question three is absolutely massive. Okay, so look how much text there is here. There's absolute paragraphs here, okay? If you were to just read all of this at once, your brain is just gonna get completely overwhelmed. So I'm not even gonna do that. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to read it, but as we go, as soon as we kind of get a piece of information or a sentence, we're going to process it and we're going to almost cash it in. So that means that when, when, so once we've finished reading it, we're going to already have all of the relevant information there for us, ready to kind of do the question, as opposed to reading it all at once, not doing anything and trying to keep it all in your head and it's just not going to work. This happens way too much and it's a, it's, it's a reason why Students, you know, have a lot of trouble on these bigger questions. So what we're going to do is the following. Let's read it. Two blocks A and B of masses 2 and 3 and respectively are attached to the end of a light string. Okay, that's just what's in the diagram. That makes sense. Initially, A is held at rest on a fixed rough plane. Okay, so that tells us that, you know, if we ever have to do any suva or anything like that, we know that U, the initial velocity, is going to be zero. So that's quite good to know. Plane is inclined at an angle alpha to the horizontal ground where tan alpha equals 5 over 12. Why don't they just tell us alpha here? Bit weird that, isn't it? Turns out that, okay, what I could do, right, is I could just do the inverse tan of five over 12 and get alpha. But that's not gonna be exact. I'm gonna lose accuracy because I'm gonna have to round it. And then later on, I'm just gonna have to do sine of alpha and cos of alpha anyway in, in my calculator, further losing accuracy. But what we could do is the following. I'm gonna draw a little right angle triangle for you here. Now, I'm going to actually use Sokotoa, bit of a blast from the past, right? Sokotoa, let's have a think. If tan is opposite over adjacent, and I was to just say, okay, let's, let's imagine this is alpha, well then opposite could be 5, adjacent would be 12, and then that, that's consistent, isn't it? Because tan alpha equals 5 opposite over 12, adjacent. So what we can actually do is from this triangle get sine and cos. Instead of having to, you know, use my calculator to do the inverse and everything like that. Because if I use Pythagoras to get this, which would, you know, square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared, I'm going to get 13. 
What a surprise, it's a nice number. That's because they did it for a reason, right? Happens with three, four, and five a lot as well. So you might see tan alpha to be like three over four or something like that. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that sine is going to be equal what? O over H, so five over 13. And cos is going to equal A over H, so 12 over 13. Notice how I've done all of this straight away now without, um, you know, even finishing reading the question. I've cashed this information in, so it's now one less thing for me to worry about. Cool. String passes over a smooth, small pulley P fixed at the top of the plane. Yeah, we can just see it in the diagram. Part of the string from A to P is parallel to a line of greater slope of the plane. So that just means that this string here is parallel to the plane. And, and again, you can see that in the diagram, they're going in the same direction. Uh, block B hangs freely below P, as shown in figure one. Yeah, so again, the diagram. The coefficient of friction between A and the plane is two thirds. So that is useful. Let's get that down. Mu, coefficient of friction is two thirds. Definitely going to have to use that later. Write it down so you're not looking for it in this absolute essay in the question, right? It's there for you now. The blocks are released from rest with a string taut and A moves up the plane. So that is good to know. It means, you know, if we were to get the diagram up here, the A is going to go up this way. Because it's, it's not always immediately obvious, right? Because it could go the other way, you know, depending on the kind of coefficient of friction and the masses involved. A could go down and B could go up. But it's good to know that A is going this way and B is going this way. The tension in the string immediately after the blocks are released is T. Cool, it's just given us a variable. The blocks are modelled as particles and the strings modelled as being inextensible. So, so your classic assumptions. Cool. I'm not even going to read what question A is asking me before getting all of the forces on this diagram. You, you just can't not, okay? So let's start with B. One of its weight taking it down. Weight is always mass times G, so 3mg. Uh, and then the tension. So let's ask ourselves, what is the tension trying to do to this block B? If the string wasn't there, what would happen? It would fall down even quicker. So the tension is trying to pull it up, isn't it? So I'm gonna have a T going upwards, A. So we know that the tension is going to be pulling it up the plane, so that's going to be going this way. We've got a reaction force that is always going to act perpendicular to the plane, you know, whether there's friction or not. So this reaction force. What else have we got? So the weight is always going to be going straight down. It's not going to be going this way. It's always straight down to the earth, okay? So we're going to have weight, which again, mass times gravity, 2mg. What else do we have? We know this is a rough plane, so there is going to be friction. It's just going to oppose the motion. So tension is going that way, exact opposite direction. Cool. There is one thing that I like to do with these types of diagrams. And what it is, is it's just doing a little dotted line here. And the reason is this angle is always going to be alpha. Now that is super useful because we're going to be resolving this 2mg in these directions. This is the direction that is, you know, perpendicular to the plane and parallel to that r. So that's very important direction. And just know it's always going to be alpha. It's going to save you a lot of trouble in the future. So I now think we're ready to finally actually look at what this thing's even asking us. So part A says, show that t equals 12mg over 5. Okay. So it's not giving us much, but we've already got enough to be going on with, right? So it doesn't matter what they're asking for. They could be asking for T or A or anything like that. Essentially, we just need to apply the standard equations of motion to this diagram. We've done a lot of the hard work because we've got all the arrows, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem here. We're going to need to apply F equals MA to A and F equals MA to B. And we know that that's the equation that holds here because this system is accelerating. You're gonna have the same acceleration because they're connected by a taut string. So let's just crack on. So let's do it for particle A, why not? So F equals MA. Now F is gonna be the resultant force in the direction of acceleration. So it's accelerating up the plane like this. So it's gonna be everything taking it up the plane minus everything taking it down the plane is equal to MA. And M in this case is 2M. And A is, we don't know, so it's just going to be A. Okay, so everything taking it up, tension. Minus everything taking it down. So we've got this friction perfectly taking it, you know, opposing the motion. And then what we have is we have the components of the weight that's trying to take it down the plane. So we're going to need to resolve it. It's going to be the force and then times by something that is the resolved part of it. The way that I like to think of this, here is our line. The line that we want to get to is here, that we want to resolve to is here. So I think about the angle and I think, okay, well, the angle's here. 
If I want, if I go across the angle, it's going to be cos. And if I go away from the angle, I'm going to use sine. So my line's here. The line I want to get to is here. I need to go this way. But my angle's here. So I'm going away from the angle to get to the line that I care about. So that means that I'm going to use sine. Across, cos, away, sine. So 2mg sine alpha. And that's going to equal 2ma. Okay, let's clean this up a bit because there's a bit that we can do. T we're not going to know yet. F. What's F? Well, f is less than or equal to mu r, meaning that the f max, which is what is, you know, applied when the particle is moving, f is doing as much as it can, f max is just going to equal mu r. We know mu, don't we? We know that mu is two thirds, and we can get r, because we can get r from resolving this way. Now, in this plane, in this direction is in equilibrium because it's not going into the table and it's not going outwards. It's only going in this way. So the forces are balanced in this direction. So R is going to be equal to 2mg. And now look, to get to this line, we go across the angle cos. So it's going to be 2mg cos of alpha. Now cos of alpha, we know is 2, two over 13. So I can get all of these numbers in. I'm going to get 2 over 3 times 2 times by 12 over 13, straight to your calculator, right? So two over three times two times by 12 over 13, it's gonna get me 16 over 13. So I know that my F is 16 over 13 mg. Perfect, stick that in there. So 16 over 13 mg. Right, what else have we got? Two mg times sine alpha, but we already know sine alpha because we did the work before, right? So I'm gonna get two times five over 13, lots of mg. So that's minus 10 over 13 mg. This is good. This is good. So equals 2ma. Let's do one more bit of cleaning up because these are both mg terms, which is nice. So t minus. So you're allowed to do this in your calculator. I'm just noticing that, look, minus, they've got the same denominator. So it's actually quite easy to kind of add and take away, isn't it? Minus 16, minus 10, lots of one over 13 kind of thing. So that's going to be minus 26 over 13. Oh, wait, that's just two, isn't it? So T minus 2 mg equals 2ma. Woo! Let's call that equation one. It's a nice equation, right? Let's do the same for B, which is going to be a bit less work. And then we're just going to get T, right? So let's have a look at B. Or B, again, F equals MA. This time it's going to be down, take away up because the particle is accelerating downwards. So everything taking it down is going to be 3MG minus T. That's the only thing taking it up is equal to MA. It's M is 3M times by A. <laughs> Much easier that time, right? So now let's just do some maths. So we've got simultaneous equations and we want T. So we want to eliminate A. I've got 2MA here and 3MA here. So if I was to times this whole equation by three, I'd get a 6MA here. If I was to times all of this by two, I'd get a 6MA here and then we can cancel. So I'll times this one by three to get 3T minus 6MG equals 6MA. And then I'm going to times this one by two to get 6MG minus 2t equals 6ma. We now know that if we were to take these equations away, these 6ma's are going to cancel and, and I'm going to be left with an equation just in t. So why don't I do this one take away this one? So I'm going to get 3t minus 6mg and then minus, make sure you put a bracket here, 6mg minus 2t. And then equals 6ma minus 6ma on the right. Cool, right. So this is going to be the bit where it all becomes nice. So let's look at how many t's I've got. I've got 3t minus minus 2t. So that's going to be 3t add 2t, which is going to be 5t. And then these I've got minus 6mg minus 6mg. So that's going to be minus 12mg equals 6ma minus 6ma is 0. Ooh, we're getting there. Take the 12mg onto this side. 5t equals 12mg. Divide by the 5, and I really hope this is correct. 12mg over 5, and the answer is 12mg over 5. Cool. Woo, that's the chunk of the marks. Um, they could have asked for anything. It's always going to be, always, always, always just going to be F equals MA. Do some simultaneous equations. You're always going to be doing the same thing. I, I promise you that. Right. After B reaches the ground, 
A continues to move up the plane until it comes to rest before reaching P. Okay, so then it comes to rest and it's not really connected to B anymore. Determine whether A will remain at rest, carefully justifying your answer. What's the situation that we have here then? So essentially, we've now got A and not really anything else, right? We've got, you know, we've got this string here, but it's, you know, it's not taught anymore. B is on the ground, so that's not really affecting it at all. So essentially, we've got this block A, and then we ask ourselves, is it going to fall down the plane? So what are going to be the forces acting at this point? Tension's gone, hasn't it? Tension is absolutely gone. But there are, there are things that remain. The coefficient of friction is going to be the same, isn't it? It's still going to have a reaction force. It's still got its weight acting downwards, which is this, um, you know, 2mg. And then what else is going? Well, well, we still have friction. So then last time friction was going down the plane. But remember, friction always opposes motion and opposes the kind of forces trying to pull it. But, but in this case, we've not got tension trying to pull it up the plane. So it's actually what this block wants to do at this point is just succumb to the weight force, which is trying to take it down the plane. So the friction is actually going to be opposing this motion and going up the plane in this case, because the friction is now saying, well, that, well, you want to fall down and I want to keep you up. So I suppose the question now becomes, is the friction going to be big enough to hold out from this force here? That's the question, isn't it? So essentially, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, well, the force going down the plane, that's going to be this 2mg sine alpha from before, isn't it? Because we know that this is alpha. So this is the 2mg sine alpha, and then, you know, which I believe we have worked out. So yeah, because the sine alpha is the 5 over 13, so this is going to be what, the 10 over 13 mg. And then the f max, I believe we've worked that out as well, have we not? Because that is the 16 over 13. And now this isn't going to change because look, f max is a function of mu, which isn't going to change. That's just to do with the kind of materials in the block and the plane and how they interact with each other. The r doesn't change because that's just acting in this direction. We've removed the tension, but the r direction hasn't been affected at all. So this is still 16 over 13 mg. So the, the friction kind of, well, the f max is 16 over 13 mg. So as long as the force going down is less than or equal to 16 over 13 mg, friction is strong enough to keep it still. So A is not going to move because friction is greater than the downwards force. Therefore, ah, <laughs> therefore A will remain at rest. Simple as that. Cool. Part C. So just two refinements to the model that would make it more realistic. Okay, so, you know, this is a classic here. Um, not really, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty similar to, you know, all of the, all of the questions of this type. There were loads of things. Um, so, for example, in reality, the string is probably going to be at least a bit extensible, isn't it? You know, you're going to be able to pull it at least a tiny bit. That's going to affect the motion because that was one of the assumptions we made. So we could say, you know, string could be extensible. Uh, extensible. So it's a good idea to actually just look at the assumptions that the questions made and say, wait a minute, wouldn't in reality those assumptions not hold? And then, you know, be quite easy. So look, blocks modeled as particles, strings modeled as being inextensible. So that's something straight away, there's your answer, right? Blocks are modeled as particles. In reality, are those blocks going to be particles? Well, no, they're blocks, aren't they? So, you know, they're going to have a, a distance in themselves. You might have an uneven weight distribution. You need to take into account the dimensions of these boxes. You might have different gravitational forces depending on how big they are, etc., etc., etc. So right there, you've got your answer. So you could say string being extensible and then blocks or, you know, almost the dimensions of the blocks taken into account because that's what modeling as a particle does it just get it doesn't take into account the dimensions and it just says let's imagine it all acts at the points but that's not true in reality is it so you see there the question has given us our answer and that is question three question four is absolutely massive so you know there's not many questions in these stats and mechanics papers 
but they're absolutely massive. So take that as you will. So again, loads of writing. So I'm gonna, you know, read each bit of information and cash it in as it comes, as opposed to just getting confused by the whole thing. So ramp AB of length eight meters and mass 20 kg rests in equilibrium with the end A on a rough horizontal ground. Grant rests on a smooth, solid cylindrical drum, which is partly under the ground. The drum is fixed with its axis at the same horizontal level as A. The point of contact between the ramp and the drum is C, where AC equals 5, as shown in figure 2. So it's essentially so far just showing us what we have in the diagram. The ramp is resting in a vertical plane, which is perpendicular to the axis of the drum at an angle of theta to the horizontal, where, oh, look at this, tan theta equals 7 over 24. Why do you think they've done that? Because they want you to do what we always do. We're gonna get the triangle, we're gonna suck a toe of it, and everyone's gonna be happy because we're gonna get a sine and cos without ever having to touch theta itself. So, uh, toe opposite over adjacent, so seven over here as the opposite, and 24 as the adjacent. We're gonna use Pythagoras to get the hypotenuse, so, the square root of seven squared plus 24 squared. And lo and behold, it's a nice number. Who would have thought it? So that's 25. So again, sine alpha theta this time is going to equal opposite seven over 25. And cos theta is going to equal adjacent 24 over 25. Cool. So the ramp is modeled as a uniform rod. What does that mean? That means that its center of mass acts in the center, right? So if this rod has a length of eight meters, five plus three, then its center of mass, its weight is going to act four meters in half of eight. So that's gonna be before it hits the drum about here, which is going to be 20 G downwards because its mass is 20 kilos. Cool, okay, let's have a look at part A. Explain why the reaction from the drum on the ramp at point C acts in a direction which is perpendicular to the ramp, okay. Interesting question. I think before you got the forces on the diagram, which you should just always do before answering the question, this will be quite hard to answer. So let's get the forces on, see what we're working with, and then we'll, we, it might become more obvious. Okay, what's kicking off at A? So you're always gonna have, when it's on any surface, a reaction going perpendicular to this surface. So we're gonna have a reaction here, let's call it our A. We are gonna have friction because the, the horizontal ground we're told is rough. So what direction is the friction gonna act in? I think it's a good idea to think about what would happen to this ramp, you know, if this was just a slippery surface that didn't really have any friction. The ramp would almost wanna fall this way, wouldn't it? It'd slip off and go down and then eventually kind of just go down this way. That means that because there actually is friction, the friction wants to oppose that. So the friction is going to be going this way towards the drum to stop that ramp falling in. Cool. What's happening at the drum? Again, you're always going to have a perpendicular reaction force. The so perpendicular this time is going to be going here, our C. And we're told that there's no friction here because it's smooth. So that means that I've got no force kind of acting this way. And that's actually kind of the answer to this question here. Because if you think about it, uh, A, you know, the resultant reaction, because there's, there's a force going this way and this way, is kind of going to be like around here, right? So something like that would have happened at C if there were to be friction, but there's no friction. So the only force acting is this. So that's how I'd answer this question, right? I would say, look, the drum is smooth, so no friction, you know, so the only force acting is the... Um, perpendicular reaction force, essentially. More than enough to get that mark there, I reckon. Cool, part B. Okay, so it looks like you're now into the, the meat of the question. So it says, find the magnitude of the resultant force acting on the ramp at A. So that's that reaction that I was just talking about. I've got a friction going this way, and a reaction going up, so the resultant is gonna be you know something around here. So to get that, I'm gonna need the RA, I'm gonna need the F, and then I can work out the results and doing a bit of Pythagoras and stuff, but we'll cross that bridge when you come to it. Okay, so what equation is going to act on this system? We can have moments, this is more or less a moments question, and then we can also have, look, this is in equilibrium, so that means that everything that we're used to still applies, right? We know it can do up equals down, we know it can do left equals right, so all of that is, is fair game. So let's start with moments. 
Little tip for you here, when you're deciding where to take moments from, it's a really good idea to take it from a point where there's loads of forces acting. Because what that's actually going to do is that's going to eliminate the forces from the equation. Why? Because a moment is force times distance. But if the distance from the force to the point is zero, because it's the same point, then I'm going to get whatever the force is times zero, and it's going to be eliminated from the equation. That's good, isn't it? Because that means that if I take moments about A, I'm not going to need to worry about RA, and I'm not even going to have to worry about F. So the only two forces in my equation are going to be this. And look, there's only one unknown here, that RC. So I think just taking moments, I'm going to be able to get RC. So our C kind of wants to rotate it this way. And then the 20G wants to pull it the other way, right? And the equilibrium of moment states that these rotational forces should be balanced. These moments should be balanced. So the moment from our C, well, it's going to be 5, which is the distance from A to our C. And then just times by our C. I don't need to do any resolving here because this RC is already completely perpendicular. Unlike this 20G. So it's 4 meters away because, you know, the center of the mass is 4 meters away. But then times by 20g, but I'm actually going to need to resolve it in this direction, that perpendicular direction. We know that this angle should be theta, and I need to go across the angle to get to that dotted line. So it's going to be 4 times 20g cos theta. So I can actually work out RC here, can't I? Because I know that if I divide by 5, so I'll just have kind of 4 over 5, then I'll have this 20g. I also know that cos theta is 24 over 25. So this is just going to be times 24 over 25. And I am more than ready to get this into my calculator. So I'm going to do 4 over 5 times by 20 times. Now we're told at the front of this question booklet that we need to take g to be 9.8. That's exactly what I shall do. Times 9.8 times by 24 over 25. Now that's going to get me some dirty fraction. I'm going to put that into a decimal quickly. And that's going to be 150.528. Now that's not rounded, and I'm going to be sure not to round anything before I get to this final answer, and then I can do my rounding. Cool, right, so we've done our moments and we've got our C from it, so pretty successful so far. What else can we do to this? Well, we can do up equals down, because it's in equilibrium, and we can do left equals right. Why don't we start with up equals down? Because I've got this RA, which is nicely in the vertical direction, so is the 20g. So the only thing that I would actually need to resolve here is this RC. Essentially, I'd need to resolve it in this direction here, wouldn't I? So I suppose the question then becomes, what's this angle going to be? I need this angle here. Well, if I was to draw a horizontal line here, this is going to be theta, isn't it? Because it's the same as this. But if we look here, this is a right angle. So that means that this angle here, which is the, you know, the angle left, is going to be 90 minus theta. But then I say, ha, huh, I've got another right angle, and that is this here. So that means that this angle here is just going to be 90, which is this right angle, and then take away this red angle here. So it's going to be 90, take away 90 minus theta. So it's actually just going to be theta again, which is nice. So that, you know, doesn't require a lot of work because I already know the value of sine and cos of that. So if I was to do the following, up equals down, simple as that. So everything taking it up is going to be RA plus and then RC cos theta, as we've just shown. It's going to equal everything taking it down, which is just the 20G. Right, so we've got a load of these numbers. So let's just, just work it out. So RA, which is the thing that we want here, is going to be 20G minus RC, which we know to be 150.528 times cos theta, which we know to be 24 over 25. Again, straight to the calculator, 20 times 9.8 minus 150.528 times by 24 over 25. Woo, so many numbers, which gets me 51.49312. Okay, we're getting there because we've got one of the components of this resultant at A. The only thing we need now is the friction. I think this is going to be a bit easier because look at this. Look at the only forces acting horizontally here. I've got the friction, which acts straight to the right, and I've got this RC, which has a component going to the left. And they're the only ones because the other ones act straight vertically. So friction is going to be completely balanced by 
the component of RC, so it's going to be RC, and then I need to go away from the angle to get this component here, so it's going to be RC sine theta. So F is going to be balanced by RC sine theta. So again, I know all of these numbers, don't I? RC, so I'm going to go straight to this. It's going to be 150.528, and then times by sine alpha, which we have shown to be 7 over 25. So times by 7 over 25, and that gets me 42.14784. Again, try not to round before you get to that final answer. We're getting there, because what's happening at A? We have a frictional force going this way of magnitude 42.14784. And then we also have this reaction going upwards of 51.49312. So in total, the resultant of what these forces are trying to do, they're trying to take it up here, aren't they, in this diagonal. So how am I going to get that? I'm just going to use Pythagoras. So, so the resultant at A, we can just do something like that doesn't really matter how you denote it, is going to be the square root of all of this stuff. So I'm not even going to write it again. It's basically just going to be that F, isn't it? Squared plus all of this stuff, which is going to be the R A squared. Okay, straight to the calculator and we can finally box off this part of the question. So the square root of 42.14784 squared plus... 51.49312 squared is going to get me 66.543 dot dot dot, which I will round to 66.5 newtons. Cool, nine marks there, so it's a bit of a chunk. Okay, looks like I've only got one mark left. So the ramp is still in equilibrium in the position shown in figure two, but the ramp is not now modeled as being uniform. Given the center of mass of the ramp is assumed to be closer to A than to B, okay, state how this would affect the magnitude of the normal reaction between the ramp and the drum at C. Okay, let's think about it. It's currently here. So I've got this force here. It's quite close to the drum. The drum's feeling it, right? Imagine you stood here. What's going to happen? This drum is definitely going to feel that force. Imagine I now walk down here closer to A. The drum is going to get that load taken off it, and then the ground at A is going to start feeling it a lot more, and that reaction at A is going to go up. You know, the, the, it's going to start digging into the ground a lot more. I get closer to here, it starts digging into the drum a lot more. So if I take this force, which is currently quite close to the drum, send it down here till it's, so it's going nearer to A, then the reaction at A is going to increase, and the reaction at C is going to decrease because it's not actually feeling that force as much. So it says, state how this would affect the magnitude of the normal reaction, which is that reaction at C. So I would just say um, the normal reaction at C would decrease, essentially. And that's just one mark there, so I don't think I need much explanation. Cool. We are now on the last question of the mechanics, and it looks like we have some projectiles. So we have the points A and B, which lie 50 meters apart on horizontal ground. And T equals zero, two small balls, P and Q, are projected in the vertical plane containing AB. Well, P is projected from A with a speed of 20 meters a second at 30 degrees to AB. Well, Q is projected from B with speed U meters a second at angle theta to BA, as shown in figure three. At time t equals 2 seconds, P and Q collide. Until they collide, the balls are modelled as particles moving freely under gravity. Okay, find the velocity of P at the instant before it collides with Q. Okay, so with projectiles, it's, it's SUVAT, essentially. So what you can do is horizontal and vertical act completely independently, meaning I can set up a SUVAT for my horizontal motion and then separately set up a SUVAT for my vertical motion. In this case, we want the velocity of P. So it's going to be, you know, some horizontal velocity and some vertical velocity. I'm then going to be able to get the resultant of those two. So I'm going to set up my SUVATs for P and then kind of see what I have. So for P, horizontally, let's see what we have. SUVAT. Okay, so for S, don't know what S is. I don't know where they collide. 
The u, that's going to be the horizontal component of that initial velocity. So that's going to be 20 cos 30. I'm going to go across that angle to get the horizontal component. So that's 20 cos 30. V, well, it's what I'm trying to find out, isn't it? A, so acceleration horizontally is actually going to be zero. If you think about it, all the acceleration is due to gravity, which is just going straight down to the earth. But acceleration is actually zero in that case. And T, we are told, is two when these collide. So that's enough information to me to, for me to work out V here. So basically, I mean, I'll give you a little spoiler because there's no acceleration. The velocity isn't going to change at all. But if you were to kind of wanted to prove that, you would say V equals U plus AT. And then which equals U, 20 cos 30, plus, you know, A, which is zero times two. So it's 20 cos 30. Vertically, there might be a tiny bit more work. So let's have a look. Set up our SUVAT again. Right, and what do we have? Again, don't know where they collide, so S we don't know. U is going to be the vertical component of that initial velocity, so that's going to be 20 sine 30. Again, V is what I want. A, so now this is the gravity, isn't it? So because gravity is, you know, trying to pull it down, even though my, even though my particle is traveling upwards at the moment, its acceleration is downwards. So that means that the acceleration is gonna to have to be negative here. The amount of people I see that just do positive G or positive 9.8, it's a mistake, right? So A is gonna be minus 9.8. And again, T is two. So we can do a V equals U plus AT on this one now, can't we? So I can say that V is gonna equal U, which is 20 sine 30 plus AT. So that's minus 9.8 times two. Straight to your calculator. 20 sine 30 minus 2 times 9.8 is going to equal minus 48 over 5. Does it make sense that it's negative? Yeah, it can, it can easily be negative. That's fine. That would just mean that P is at the point where it's going back down again. But yeah, V being negative is allowed. So at this point, what's going on? We've got some horizontal velocity going this way, which is 20 cos 30. We then have 48 over 5 going downwards because it's negative. So the resultant is just going to be the hypotenuse of this triangle here. So I'm just going to use Pythagoras. So, you know, the, the magnitude of V or however you want, to, you want to call it or your speed is going to be to square root of 20 cos 30 all squared. Make sure that all of this is in brackets here. So your calculator knows that you need to square the 20 as well. So that's going to be following. And I'm then going to add 48 over 5 squared in the square root. And that is going to get me to three significant figures, 19.8 meters per second. So we're asked for the velocity. So to fully describe this velocity, so if it just said the speed, then speed doesn't care about direction the speed is just 19.8 we're asked about velocity so i think it would be safe here to also find out the angle so then i can say okay that fully describes it because remember velocity has the magnitude and the direction the vector quantity so i think it would be good to say okay so the velocity is 19.8 meters per second you know at an angle of mm, to the horizontal or something and if you think about it if we got this here we got that angle that shows me okay i'm this many degrees under the horizontal I fully describe the velocity so i can use i can use trig based basic trig right soccer toa if you think about it we have the opposite and the adjacent here so the toa i'm going to use tan so if i was to just say that theta is the inverse tan of oa so opposite 48 over 5 and then over 20 cos 30 here over the adjacent so let's get that into our calculator. So well, first of all, no, let's, let's get it all in at once. Why not? So tan to the minus one of 48 over five divided by 20 cos 30. Make sure I close all of my relevant brackets and I'm going to get 28.997, etc. cetera, blah, 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 blah. So let's round that to basically 30. 30 degrees, 30.0 if I want to go three significant figures technically. Cool. And then I would say, you know, under, below the horizontal. Cool. 
Fantastic. Let's see what we have for part B. Find the size of the angle theta, yep, and the value of u. So I assume, you know, we're just going to kind of do all of this together. Okay, so there's quite a lot that we need to work out really, isn't there? We've got the, you know, both of these unknowns. We still don't know where they collide. There's probably quite a lot, quite a few places we can get equations here. Let's have a look at this diagram, okay? So if you think about it, they're 50 meters apart. They're then gonna kind of, they're both gonna travel some horizontal distance and then they're gonna hit. So I don't know exactly what this horizontal distance is and I don't know exactly what this horizontal distance is, but what are they added together? I know that whatever, this could be tiny and this will be massive or they could be a bit more even, but they've got to add up to 50, haven't they? Because between them, they close that gap of 50 meters. So if I work out the horizontal distance for P, add it to the horizontal distance for Q, it's gonna to have to be 30, right? 30, it's gonna to have to be 50. So what is it? Let, let's go back to the SUVAT for P quickly. The horizontal SUVAT for P, we have this. So basically I can actually use S equals UT plus a half UT squared here. Now, it's actually quite easy again because A is zero. So it's just going to be S equals UT, which is great. So in other words, it's going to be 20 cos 30 times two. So that's fantastic. So I know that whatever P travels, which is 20 cos 30 times by two, and then it's going to be plus whatever happened, whatever the horizontal distance for Q is. So we'll quickly give you a SUVAT there. So this is a horizontal SUVAT for Q. So let's have a think u cos 30, again, there's no acceleration. And then, well, it doesn't really matter what t or anything is at this point, because it's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be ut, essentially. So I'm gonna add u, which is u cos 30. t is still gonna be two. Um, so it's gonna be plus two u cos 30. All of that, 30, not cos 30, that's a cos theta, isn't it? That's the unknown that we want here. So that's going to be a u cos theta. And then all of that is going to equal 50, okay? So you can see here, we've got two unknowns, but only one equation. So we're not quite there, are we? What I will do is I'm just going to get rid of this term and merge it with the 50, so it's at least slightly easier. So I'm going to get 2u cos theta equals 50 minus... 20, well, I'm going to bring that to you here, so that's going to be minus 40 cos theta. Let's see what we've got for that. So that's going to be 50 minus 40 cos theta is going to give us... I'm going to keep this in its third form, actually, because, again, it's not my final answer, so I don't want to introduce any rounding errors. I've got one equation here and two unknowns. I'm going to need another equation, okay? How can we get that? Think about it, right? We've, all, we've got an equation that relates the horizontal displacement of these things, but we also know what the vertical displacement is going to be because they're going to have to be the same. They both go up vertically. They start at the same point, don't they? They start here, they both go up, and then they hit each other. It doesn't matter how far along it is because we've already taken that into account in this equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up vertical SUVATs for both of these, see what we can do. So let's go P here. Now, we did set this up up there, so I will, I will call this S just S because I see that's going to be what we're equaling. And then the U is going to be the 20 sine 30. V we have, but I don't really care about it too much at this point. And we have that A not equaling zero now, do we? Because this is vertical. So the A is going to be minus 9.8. We also have T equals 2. The Q, what do we have? We have. So quite similar things, right? A is minus 9.8. They both you know, are acted upon by gravity. T is also 2. But then the U in this case is going to be U sine theta. So U sine theta. Okay, I can, I can use S equals UT plus a half UT squared again, set them both equal to each other. So the UT plus a half UT squared for P is going to be 20 sine theta. 30 times by 2 plus a half at, so that's going to be minus a half times 9.8 times 2. That's the half at squared, so 2 squared. And then that's going to equal ut, so u sine theta, again times t, so times 2. 
and that is going to equal uh sorry minus a half times 9.8 times t squared so this is interesting isn't it they both have this term so they're just going to cancel they're both times by two here so they're also going to cancel so what that means is 20 sine 30 must be exactly the same as u sine theta this is nice we have simultaneous equations here so we have one here that gives us u sine theta. We also have this here that's 2u cos theta. So what I can do is something cheeky. Call this equation two, and then this one equation one. If I do two divided by one, I'm gonna get this u, cancel with that u, and I get a sine over cos. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So I'm gonna get u sine theta divided by 2u cos theta is going to equal 20 sine 30, divided by all of that stuff there, which is the 50 minus 20 root three. Whew, okay, we're getting there. We just gotta do some maths now. So let's see what this ha what happens with this. Sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. The u's cancel and I'm left with a two. I'm just gonna times that two up to the top. So I'm gonna get 40, two times the 20, sine theta all over 50 minus 20 root 3. Now at this point, this is just a number. It looks horrible, but it's a number. So theta is going to be the inverse tan of all of this stuff, which is going to be inverse tan. Now just make sure you get it all nicely in your brackets, and you should be okay here. So 40 sine 30 divided by 50 minus 20 times by the square root of 3. And that is going to get me 50. 2.477 da 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 i'll round it right at the end but i will hopefully use this as my answer if i then go to work out the u here so at this point you use any value of u um it doesn't really matter so i'm going to use this one here because there's just a little equation here get the value straight away there so u is going to be 20 sine 30 divided by sine now I'm just going to assign theta. I'm going to I'm going to use the unrounded version I have for my calculator that's stored in my amps. Okay, so I'm going to write the following: twenty sine thirty divided by sine of amps. Okay, and then this is going to get me twelve point six to three significant figures. So now I'm going to round that. So I'll say u is twelve point six. And then theta to three sig fig is going to be 52.5 degrees. Whew, a lot of pretty dense maths there. Tough, tough question. Um, part C just says state one limitation of the model. Okay. Um, I would say the main one in projectiles is it doesn't take into account any kind of wind or air resistance, does it? Imagine how different this, this whole thing would be about a 50 kilometer an hour wind just gushing to the left. You know what I mean? It would, it would change things a lot. So I would just say it doesn't account for wind. It does not account for wind. And I believe that is the paper on stats and mechanics done. Now, stats and mechanics is not easy and I'm not gonna pretend otherwise. I just did the exam paper. It's a bit grim, wasn't it? One of the ways that you're really gonna to need to prepare yourself for this is by doing lots and lots of past papers. So you really need to practice doing all of these questions together in that exam timed situation. Now, something that can really help you out with this is AI Tutor, and I'll show you how. So I'm just gonna grab my phone and go to AI Tutor. If I go to the exams tab, what this is gonna have is this is gonna have all of the exams from my exam board here for me, paper one, paper two, and paper three, stats and mechanics in this case. If I just press start, it's gonna generate a unique exam for me filled with stats and mechanics questions all to the specification of the exam that I'm gonna be sitting. So I can now do this, and the great thing about this is once I've finished, I can go down to submit, and I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna get it instantly marked, but I'm also gonna get a breakdown of how I'm doing, how long I'm spending on each question, and then I can go into each question and see the full solution. So you can really see where you went wrong and where you didn't. So that's aishoot.co.uk, you're gonna get exam practice, and that is a feature that you can start utilizing right away to skyrocket your grade.